Okay, and it looks like we're live. Benjamin in Germany, hello. Happy to see you here. Hello. Hello. It's so good to be here, Carrie. Thank you for inviting me. Let's give it a few more moments to see uh, people filing in here to the, the virtual kitchen. Laura Peterson Balo, Danny Miller, Barbara Boyd Doss, Anna Wong, hello. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. First off, I would like to thank everybody for uh, attending another episode of Hollywood Kitchen. Today, we are so excited, I am so excited, I think we all are, to welcome a special guest new to Hollywood Kitchen. Her name is Adrienne Omansky. She is an acting coach, a talent manager, she works with senior citizens. She is a, an incredible woman that was referred to me by two very dear friends. And she's also a Shirley Temple expert and collector. So I am very happy to welcome Adrian Omansky to Hollywood Kitchen today. Oh, thank you. It's so great being here and talking about one of my favorite people, one of my favorite stars. And I do call Shirley a star, of course. So thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you for being here. and. I want to kind of, at the start of the episode, do a bit of a 101 for people who may not be familiar with Shirley, which I find hard to believe anyone would not know who Shirley is, but there may be people out there who don't. So, Adrian, can you give a quick synopsis, very quick, of just Shirley as a movie star for people who are not familiar? Well, Shirley was born um, in Santa Monica to Gertrude um, and George Temple. And her mother knew when she was born, when she was just a baby, that she was going to be a star and that she was going to help her meet that goal. And um, Shirley was very special. There were many child stars in the past 50, 75, 100 years, but there was no one like Shirley. I agree. She was definitely in a class by herself. So today on the episode, we're gonna talk about Shirley's life in Hollywood, her life after Hollywood, her food, her films, and the memorabilia. And first, we are gonna start off with the recipe because Adrian, this one threw me for a loop de loop. This has been a little tricky for me this week. The recipe I found in a 1936 cookbook that I have, it's called Food and Fashions of 1936. That's great. They do not give like baking times. It'll just say until finished or, you know, until moderate oven. It's just very vague in a lot of ways. Well, I made it for the cookbook and the result was it basically cratered completely inward, kind of like this. And then when I cut into it, it was just like handfuls of loose crumbs and it was a total mess. So I had to scrap that and start yet again. So, um, but my, my dilemma became this. Um, it wasn't what we would call a normal pecan square. This recipe in this cookbook was trying to be like a chocolate pecan confection. So the question became, do I do a pecan square? Do I do a chocolate cake with pecan? Well, my frequent collaborator, Mary Stanford, came to the rescue and found a recipe that I think honors Shirley's intent with this recipe, if in fact it was her intention. <laughs> and it's called chocolate pecan pie brownies. So I think it's going to honor the idea of having the marriage of chocolate and pecan together. And I think that it will um, kind of be the best of both worlds. Carrie, that sounds great. I know in my family, my brother called me a few months ago and wanted to know my mother's banana cake recipe, which was, my mother wasn't a great cook, but that banana cake was fabulous. But when he went to make it and then I tried, it flopped because it said sipped three times and we used unsipped, pre-sipted flour. And sometimes it's very hard to translate 
you know, recipes that are from the 30s and the 40s to now to the kind of things that we have to go out and buy. So completely understandable. And I'm and I'm anxious to see what you're cooking. Thank you. Well, my, my dad's a Marine, so he's always telling me adapt and overcome. So that's that's kind of branded in my my head. So here's what we're going to do. I, I will feel much more relaxed when we get the brownies underway and then we can just talk Shirley and I can sip my Shirley Temple. So I have mine here too. Oh, yay. Very cool. Very cool. And we'll talk about that drink, by the way. We are going to address that issue later on. Good. So we're going to start out. Here's what you will need to start. There are two phases of this recipe. The first part is the actual brownie and the second part is the pecan pie filling. So we're gonna start out at first with the brownie part. So what we need first is a cup and a half of bittersweet chocolate, either the baking chocolate or chocolate chips I have right here. I'm gonna put it in my, my pan. Uh, we have one stick of unsalted butter. So here's our, here's our unsalted butter. And then let's see. We are going to start melting all of this together. The other ingredients in this recipe include two thirds cup of sugar, two large eggs, one egg yolk at room temperature, three fourths cup of flour and a half teaspoon of salt, which by the way, um, when we're done with the episode, I will post a bit about Adrian. I will post the video and I'll post a whole write up about the recipe, what went wrong and how we, we steered the ship right. So the good ship lollipop, right? So, right, exactly. So this is gonna take a minute to melt, Adrian. So while it's melting, let's talk about how you first learned about Shirley Temple. Like what was your first exposure to Shirley? My first exposure to Shirley Temple was my mother. She told me stories about my uncle and aunt working for the temples in the early 1940s. And lately we've been doing family Zooms and it's documented that they work for the temples, but we don't know exactly which date. We know that my aunt and uncle were domestics. My, um, my aunt was a cook. So it sort of fits in with this theme. And it my sure uncle does. Um, would take um, the family on errands. So my mother was always in love with Shirley. So that since I was a little girl, she would tell me about Shirley and um, how she thought that I could be an actress. What did I know? In fact, it was my mother's dream that she wanted to be an actress, which she achieved in her later years with my help. So I knew about Shirley from early on. Um, the Temple family, and I don't know who, gave my uncle um, a bowl. It was Shirley's bowl and also um, a cup. And to this day, we do not have it because during a family, I don't say dispute, but a family situation, it went to another member of the family. And the theory is what we think it was sold at a garage sale. So I never got that wonderful memorabilia from my um, aunt and uncle that um, was passed down to me. So. Oh my I'm God, that that's the story happening. there, but we've made up for it in my life for sure, for having these wonderful treasures of Shirley that I have in my collection. Well, good. I'm glad that you have made up for it then. And we are going to talk about that. Um, I think my first exposure to Shirley Temple, uh, there was a girl that I used to play with as a little girl. Her name is Lacey. We're still friends all these years later. She's my oldest friend. And I remember being at her house and seeing a framed photo of Shirley Temple sitting on the um, one of the shelves. And I remember as little kids do, just kind of staring at it and fixating on it, you know. And then later on, I saw her films on TV and she feels timeless. You know how some stars, they feel kind of of the time. But Shirley, it's like you can watch her in any era and that charm does, is not lost to the age, you know what I mean? It's still every bit as charming as it probably was in 1934, 1935. And she's very infectious. 
Absolutely. And I think not only for children, but for adults that remember her as children. And that's why I bring my collection to um, senior facilities because they remember her as a child and they can still watch her movies now and, and you know, talk about it. And I just love bringing my dolls to the nursing home. And I've had some really unusual experience bringing them to nursing home and, and to senior facilities. So now what I do is I have paper cutouts and I leave them with people that were fa fans of Shirley because one time one of my dolls was missing. So anyways, oh, wow. uh, I just love leaving the cutouts with them and they keep them in their room and to remind them of the times that they watched Shirley as a kid. So I know exactly what you're talking about. And also, okay, so now, oh, wow, we've got some silky chocolates and oh, great. going on here. Okay. So by the way, we've already to start out with preheated the oven, which I'm not going to turn on now because I will have a heat stroke, but later. I've got my eight by eight baking pan, which I have lined with Crisco and also parchment paper. Let's see, and then, okay, so we've melted the butter and the chocolate. Now we're gonna add the sugar and beat well. Okay, add our sugar, continue to stir, and then add in eggs and mix in. By the way, I am cat sitting right now for a friend, so if a gorgeous black cat hops into the frame, uh, that's, that's what that is. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, add eggs and mix in. So now we're adding the two large eggs. Let's see, get this nice and mixed up here. All right, add flour and salt and stir until combined. Okay, so now let's see. Um, sorry, we're going to add the room temperature egg to the flour. It is so hot in here. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I'm just trying to, trying to survive. Okay, um, while I'm stirring this, because it's going to take a minute to stir, um, one of the things that, um, what was Shirley's breakthrough? Because I know that I've seen some of the baby burlesque she was in, and they really come across as kind of shocking, especially the one where she's uh, playing Marlene and Dietrich in the Blue Angel. Absolutely. But, oh gosh, that's so wrong on like every- we, we, we were discussing some of the Shirley group about, you know, um, we don't think that most mothers would have uh, would allow today the, the there are young, three-year-old because that's when she made her first movie when she was three years old um to be in such a provocative you know you, you using babies basically to be in movies we don't think so but gertrude was a fabulous mother she took fabulous care of shirley and watched over her in every single one of her movies so and shirley has wonderful things to say about her right um Carrie, I know that you wrote, read the book, so she had always wonderful things to say about her parents. Yeah, and I've, I've always, one of the things I've always been fascinated by is sort of the psychology of child stars then and now. And I think a lot of the time when the parents see them simply as a walking ATM and they don't treat them like a human being, they just treat them like a product and it's just, I think that's when they have a lot of trouble. And also when the parents are depending on that kid as the sole financial support of the family, I think that's when it really gets, really gets dicey. And that really becomes an exploitative and unhealthy situation. But yeah, Absolutely. Shirley seems to have had a terrific relationship with her mother. And I'm guessing that's why Shirley probably had such a successful adult life. And she wasn't, you know, having horrible problems or in the tabloids as a kid or a teenager. And you know what I mean? I think that probably made a huge Absolutely. Difference. That's true. Um, I, her first breakout role that I think is when she went to Fox studio and made stand up and cheer and saying, baby takes a bow. To me, that was her breakthrough role. She wanted to be in our gang and she actually 
Uh, I mean, her mother wanted her to be in our gang. And what happened was she wanted her to have top billing and they wouldn't let her have top billing. So that's why she wasn't in our gang. And um, the rest is history when she went to Fox Studios and that's when she became a star. And I do feel that, um, you know, there were problems in the entertainment industry of abuse and things of that sort. And I'm sure you read that in her book too, the inappropriate behavior by certain of, you know, um, the people in the studios. But by and large, um, she had a wonderful life. She was treated beautifully and her mother made sure that she was treated beautifully. And I, I do want to bring this up for that movie that she did and the song that she sang, Baby Take a Bow. Mm -hmm. She got the first juvenile Oscar and that was um, on March 18th, um, 1935. And um, Stand Up and Sure was 1934. So a year later, she was awarded that. And something cute that she said was that um, mom, when she was given, given the little Oscar, and that should be in the Academy, when the Academy opens at the end of September, that should be there. She said, mom, can we go home now? Isn't that something that a six-year-old would say? Honestly, I think most adults at the Oscars would probably say that too. Or they probably want to go party or go elsewhere after they, they pick up that statuette. Exactly. So well, I, think, I, I think that that was her breakout role. They all had happy endings because that's what we needed in our country at that time. We needed happy endings, didn't we? And that's how come everybody loved her movies. Well, I'm gonna pour this in the pan here while we're talking. But yeah, I think, I, I know during the pandemic, which is, I wouldn't say it's like the Great Depression, but it's definitely a, a national time of emergency and crisis. But there's certain movies that I watched simply because they reassure me that the world is going to be okay, that life will end happily, everybody will be fine. And even if that's not necessarily true, at least for two hours, I can think that it is true. And those movies really, it can't be understated kind of the impact and the importance of that because it's kind of like a soothing balm to the nation, you know? Absolutely. Kind of our, you know, a cinematic equivalent of comfort food, really. I think when you talk to most people, during difficult times, a happy ending is really important or a, or a feel good movie that has a resolution that's happy. So, okay, so I know. this is what the brownies look like in the pan. That looks great. So what we're going to do now, we're going to set this aside and I'm going to make the pecan pie filling. And then after we make the pecan pie filling, we will be home free and I can just relax with the cooking and talk all about Shirley. So. Let me see. When you're done with that, could I show you a picture of Shirley cooking in the um, kitchen? I would love that. Please do. Please do. You tell me when you're ready, and I'll and I'll bring it up. Okay. Um. Hang on just a sec. Let's see. Okay, bring it up while I'm setting up for the pecan pie filling. Oh, that is so cute. Oh my gosh, I love it. Is that from a movie or just a publicity stunt? You know, I think it's just a publicity still. And I, I must say, Shirley was the most photographed child actor ever. The most photographed. So it's very easy to find pictures of her on the internet um, if anybody wants to buy a particular one on eBay. And of course, being a collector, we exchange pictures. Our group, ex ex you know, we exchange pictures. And when we have something that's collectible, people in our group will find pictures with that particular item with Shirley. And that makes it you know, so wonderful to have. So I thought that was really cute. And if you notice, she has a glass next to her and that will be the story of the um, Shirley Temples when we get around to it, right? Yes, let's make that pecan pie filling first and then we will get around yeah. to that. Yeah. Okay, so for the pecan pie filling, we're going to do one fourth cup of unsalted butter. Let's see. Okay. One half cup of brown sugar packed. So, got our brown sugar here. All right. I'm going to kind of let this um, 
let this get heated and mixed up here a bit. So why don't we talk about the Shirley Temple while this is melting? And we covered this territory a little bit on the Oscar cook along that we did last um, last year for or last year, a few months back for the Oscars. But let's go ahead and talk about how the Shirley Temple drink originated and how she felt about it. Well, I had to consult with my Shirley's army friends and, and Melissa Tonneson and Gail Rabb, and they're the expert, expert in Shirley Temple, both of them. And they agree with what I felt was we really don't know which restaurant it started in. So it could have been, it could have been Chasen's or it could have been the Brown Derby. We don't know. They both want to take credit for it. On the internet, you'll say that it was Chasen's. One will say Chasen's and one will say Brown Derby. But it was during that time period. But Shirley, in her book, will say, said that she actually preferred Coca-Cola. She really didn't like the Shirley Temples because they were too sweet. They were too sweet. And um, would she, the reason why she liked Coca-Cola because her mother limited her to one Coca-Cola a week, a small one. So for, for many people that are fans of Coca-Cola, you could think of that was one of Shirley's drinks as well. So okay. that surprised me because every time I do a booth or something at, at, a, at a, um, a senior event, I, I give out Shirley Temple drinks. I thought, you know, that was it, thinking that that was Shirley's favorite drink until I found out otherwise. Wow. Well, let's see. We've got the, uh, it just looks really good. I wish you could see and smell it, but it's brown sugar and butter all melted here. Now we are going to add the one fourth cup of heavy cream to it. Add a pinch of salt and a cup and a half of pecans. All right, let's see here. Okay, and according to the directions here, and again, I will um, I will show the final product in a second, but what we would do is bake the brownies at about 25 to 30 minutes at 350 degrees. And it says in this recipe, it specifies that it's really important to let the brownies cool before you spoon this hot topping on top of them. It says spread the pecan pie mixture evenly over the top of the brownies Add a couple tablespoons of mini chocolate chips if desired. You can store these at room temperature or in the refrigerator. So, all right, this is what the pecan pie filling looks like. Not sure if you can see it here. Oh, it smells so good though. All right, so let's see. That looks great, one. Carrie. It really does. It does. I, I should I work so to hard. Ask you, you were using Crisco, and that was one of the ingredients to my mother's banana cake, and her recipe was from the 1930s also. Very cool. And here is what the final product looks like. And by the way, I'm serving this on my 1930s green depression glass dishes. Ooh. <gasps> Carrie, it looks fantastic. Yes, and Adrian, if you would like, I will very gladly put these in some nice Tupperware and leave them on your doorstep. So oh, just that's so sweet. Say the word and I will do it. I will just think of it and I'll be happy. <laughs> All right, so I am going to sit my Shirley Temple and now I can relax because the heater is turned off. The, 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 the hot plate is turned off. It's not as hot. I can hmm, take a moment. Okay. So let's talk about Shirley's films. Oftentimes, Shirley is the misfix it. She's the sweet little girl that oftentimes, sometimes doesn't have a parent in the movie and charms everybody around her and usually fixes everyone's problems. And formulas, I guess, exist for a reason because they work a lot of the time. What do you think is Shirley's best film? Well, I love The Little Princess because the ending was so positive. And I know a lot of them, the endings are so positive, but how she went from rich in the orphanage and then what happened, she ended up up in the attic and cleaning houses and she was mistreated and how at the end her, um, 
her father was okay and she re reunited with him. So it sort of could tell that people could have money and then not have money, but there's more importance in um, than money. And I, and I like that theme as a little girl, but I also um, like it for another reason. Um, I was able to um, meet March Champion a few years ago. She recently passed away. She passed away um, this year. And um, Marge and I was able to interview her just casually asking her about um, the little princess. And the reason why I talked to her about the little princess is because she choreographed, she, she helped Shirley. She taught Shirley how to do ballet. And Mar if um, I'm sure you might know this or maybe not, that her um, father, Marge's father was Ernest Belcher, who was the father of ballet in Los Angeles. And um, he um, taught Marge how to dance and um, she choreographed this dance in The Little Princess for Shirley Temple. And she told me she had, had such a wonderful memory and she told me on the set she would talk to Shirley was so engaging and wanted to talk to her but her mother said okay that's enough Shirley it's, it's time now that we get back to work she said it in a very very nice way but she I, I had that connection with Marge and there's reason why I had a connection with Marge. Um, Ernest Belcher was my ballet teacher for a while and he also, my girlfriend was in his production of the Nutcracker Suite. So I adored Ernest Belcher when I was a little girl. He gave me a pair of red shoes. And I also, and I associated that um, there, they were um, ceramic shoes. And I associated that with the little princess. I always felt when I was nine years old when he gave them to me. And he gave them to me because I passed a test for my ballet for my toes, we were put on toes way too early at that time. And um, just talking to Marge Champion about Shirley, for sure that I have to say The Little Princess is my favorite movie. I love her scenes with Bilbo Jingles Robinson. To me, the two of them dancing together is movie magic. That absolutely is a lot of people's favorite. And the steps are gonna be in the academy. The steps that she danced down and her tap shoes will be in the academy. It's gonna be a whole floor carry of just um, Shirley Temple um, memorabilia. And it's gonna be an education center to educate. Um, I, I'm not sure the, you know, the whole, you know, what it exactly it's gonna be, but I can't wait to go to the museum to see. And Charles Black, Shirley's, son donated the money to have this education wing in Shirley's name at the Academy Museum. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And then, and I'm sure you'll love to see the steps that she danced on in the movie. And a lot of people say that too, because they had a special relationship and he was so kind to Shirley and Shirley to him. And it was the first time an interracial relationship in dancing on screen. And there was a lot of backlash about that, but wasn't that wonderful? I love that. I just think it's so incredibly beautiful. Well, a lot of Shirley's films are available on DVD and Amazon Prime and even Turner Classic Movies. So it's not hard to find them, which is good. And I wanted to talk about Shirley's transition out of Fox. Um, as of course, with most child stars, they grow up because none of us remain frozen in time. And I think that's gotta be very difficult for them because when you're a child star, all people remember is how you looked then. And when you're 12, 13, I know for most of us, that's a pretty awkward age. You're not a little kid, but you're not an adult. And just had a really hard time knowing what to do with kids in that age range. So as Shirley got older, how did they handle that? Well, Shirley um, retired from 20th Century Fox um, with her last picture, which was the Bluebird. And um, her contract was up and now she was gonna be going to MGM. 
And I found this picture and I bought it. I have the original picture that was, that came from a newspaper. And to me, this is sort of sad. She's packing, this is her last day at 20th Century Fox and she's packing her bag to leave. That's tough. So Shirley went on to make several movies as a young teen, you know, um, transitioning into adult films. And um, they weren't as popular as the movie she did as a child, but um, some of them were quite good. I personally love The Bachelor and the Bobby Socks with Carrie. Brown. I like that one too. <laughs> I love Since You Went Away. That was, yes, that was a good one too. Yeah. So I think she did make the transition, but I also think too, too, she seemed to kind of want a more normal life and a different life at that point, right? Oh, absolutely. She retired from film at age 22 and her last film, her movie, her movie now was Sea Biscuit in 1949. And I have a huge poster carry of that one. And I try to get it off the wall, but it is so heavy. I couldn't get down. I mean, it's oh, huge. No but uh, but uh, I do have that in my in my doll room in my memorabilia room, and um, I liked her in that movie. But it wasn't what people call the most well popular of Shirley's movies for sure. I like the one, The Hagen Girl, with Ronald Reagan. I like that one very much, and I have those posters too. And um, I thought that that was an interesting one. It was. Um, more dramatic role for her. And I thought she did well um, transitioning, but when she got to her own TV show in the 1950s, she seemed like she really loved doing TV and her story, uh, her storybook hour. And um, there she could dress up in different costumes. And she was the hostess of the storybook hour. And I um, saw some clips of this. And I'm actually wearing um, a scarf that I made and it's scenes from um, Shirley, and it's very hard to see here. It seems from Shirley um, from the storybook hour. And there's one that I wanted to talk about because I was gonna be dressing up as Mother Goose in honor of Shirley Temple's birthday a year ago. Every year the Santa Monica, um, museum because as as we know Shirley was born in Santa Monica and um, they have her red and white polka dot in a dress that was from Stand Up and Cheer. They have that one there on display but they have a luncheon that raises money for the museum in honor of Shirley and I was going to dress as Mother Goose right out of Shirley's storybook hour because she she love doing you know children's stories and she got dressed up a few times and her children were also in the um, tv show so i think she really enjoyed that time i think it was only for two years that she did that so um, she enjoyed being on television she was on the johnny carson show i have a picture of that so uh, i think she loved acting in some ways but loved her family immensely now, her first husband was John Agar, and from what I have read, apparently he started having show business aspirations of his own, and that really kind of torpedoed the marriage. He was, uh, he was um, quite a handsome person, <laughs> and um, the studios loved that they got married because it was like a Hollywood marriage, and um, the ring, it is outstanding that he put on her finger for the engagement and the wedding ring. And my, my very dear friend has that ring on her finger now. Oh, and when she, when she looks at that ring, it reminds her of Shirley in the happy time she had um, in her life for sure. And um, the marriage didn't last. They had a daughter named Susan Linda, and she's known as Susan Agar. And um, her second marriage was so happy, Shirley's marriage. And um, Charles um, Black 
adopted Susan and they had two children of their own. Oh, so and they had, his name she had with Charles Black. Yeah, they had Lori and they had Charles, the son. I think it seemed like so she, she had, had three children for a long time and stepped back from her show business career. Oh, yes. And she then went into public service. Let's talk about what inspired Shirley to get into politics and public service. Well, I think a part of it was her brother. Her brother had multiple sclerosis and she wanted to do something to help. So she um, started getting involved in raising money for multiple sclerosis. And she started an agency, um, a nonprofit to help people with multiple sclerosis. And I think that led her to public service. Not the politics itself, but the, but the wanting to help other people. And she had a heart of gold and I have clippings of um, her during this time and I've read several articles about her. And that's one of the reasons she went into public service for sure. And as we know, she was ambassador to Guyana. She was ambassador to Czechoslovakia. But one of the things I think was one of Shirley's most important contributions was going public with her diagnosis of breast cancer. I really believe that that was such an important thing during that time. Women were not talking about it. And for her to do that for a star, one of the first stars to come out in, and say that she had breast cancer was not only courageous, but to me, for her, it said a lot about Shirley. Because I think breaking a stigma is so important and sometimes it does take a celebrity saying, hey, I have this and I'm telling the world for people to kind of pay attention or maybe go get checked out themselves. And I think sometimes that um, that can really change the way people perceive a certain illness if someone they love that they're a fan of kind of has it and is willing to talk about it. I think it, it changed a lot. I think it changed a lot of people to open up and talk about it. At that time, it was, it was a stigma. And when people thought about it, they thought about that, you know, cancer, you're gonna die. And then to see someone work their way through it is extremely important. Yeah, and I think, uh, to me, I think that's, that's an incredible contribution right there that she made. Well, one of my clubs, the Shirley Temple Collectors by the Sea, we have a luncheon in honor of Shirley every single year. The club has been going on for years and years, and we donate something, a large amount of money, something, a large amount of money to a charity in um, Shirley's honor. And um, every year we select a different one. We've had breast cancer. We, we've done multiple sclerosis because of her, her brother. We, we did something that I really loved one year and that was we raised money for Girl Scouts that could not afford their uniforms. And to me, that was so perfect because we're giving something back to children. We've also given it to children's charities and um, every year that's what we do. And unfortunately for the last two years because of COVID, we couldn't have our big luncheon, but where uh, hundreds of people come and they come from all over the United States for this luncheon. Um, the other um, charity that our group is associated with and it's Shirley's Army. In Shirley's Army, um, we have a Colonel, she's the leader of our group and they actually met at the auction and they're all collectors from all over the world and um, they raise money for a charity in Shirley's honor. As a matter of fact, they gave money to the Academy. Very so cool. we're, I'm very happy to, you know, to continue um, Shirley's legacy in this way. Collecting should not, in my opinion, for me anyways, it could be whatever anyone wants it to. For me, collecting is having something in memory of that person and then doing something to honor that person. So in my case, it's bringing parts of my collection out to, to make people happy in nursing homes and retirement facilities, or just a part of my entertainment, um, my seniors that entertain during the holidays. And um, it, it is quite funny to see 
well, uh, seniors that are in their 80s through 100 years old dressed up like Shirley Temple and tap dancing. But we do have one who is an actress herself and she's fantastic. So um, we do do that and it does, for, as long as it brings a smile to people's face, why not? I totally agree. But let's see some of the other Shirley Temple memorabilia items that you have. Okay, well, I'm gonna um, tell you that this was the auction in 2015. And um, in 2015, there was a second auction. And I wanna tell everybody that um, Charles Black wanted to um, auction off Shirley's items for people to keep it in love. Not for the money, but to keep it in love. And he was so happy you know, when it went to people all over the world, that's for sure. And some of them will be reunited, some of these auction pieces at the Academy. I know that for sure. So this was my paddle from, um, in, from 2015 in um, Love Shirley. Okay, and this was a Thuriault's auction. And this is my beloved handbag. I just absolutely love this handbag. So this was Shirley's handbag and her name was engraved right oh, there. Wow. And we're a little bit crazy collectors. We're a little bit crazy. And inside was lipstick stain from Shirley. <laughs> that made it even the more, you know, everybody loved it. And it's gold lame. And this particular bag she loved. Um, Charles had said that this one she took out at a lot of places she went to into great events, but mostly when she was married to John Agar. And what happened was movie stars a lot of times do not get to keep their costumes. They go back and in, um, into, um, you know, into wardrobe and they redo them for other people, for other stars or other actors. Shirley's mother insisted on keeping all of Shirley's costumes and she kept them impeccable. That's why the collectors have these costumes. That's why. Smart woman. And, and Shirley loved her memorabilia. She loved it. She, she kept everything beautiful. So this was it. And I wanna show you the picture of her wearing this. Oh, wait, Adrian, is there any chance we could get into your memorabilia room? Could you uh, take your laptop in there or? Say it again. Is there any chance we could get a peek into your memorabilia room? Is your computer transportable? It's being right now repainted. And oh, it's right messy, but, episode. Episode. but I will show you what I have here because I do have something special I'm gonna show you okay. that I forgot about. Okay, here is Shirley. Beautiful photo. And she was at a Hollywood party. Do you see the purse? It's right there. Mm -hmm. And the necklace she's wearing, my husband got me as a gift in another auction. And it um, was Shirley's um, grandmother's necklace, and it's all garnets. Okay, so I wanted to show you that. Now I'm going to show you something special. Shirley had a very good relationship with her mom, and they celebrated all these birthdays. So I want to show you this particular, okay, where did you go? okay, Shirley bought her mother a present for her birthday. And after her mother passed away, Shirley kept it. And I just recently bought it. And I absolutely adore it. It is a jewelry box engraved to Shirley's mother. And not only that, um, Shirley bought it when she was just a young child. And she bought it at Bullock's Wilshire. And I used to love going through Bullock's Wilshire. I couldn't afford to buy anything there, but I'd love to walk through and look at the architecture and just oh, imagine that the movie stars were up there eating in the tea room. And this came from Bullock's Wilshire and I adore it. So I'm gonna, it's right here. I'm just gonna pick it up.
Okay, so it reads engraved to mother from Shirley, July 15th, 1939. So she was 11 years old at the time that she bought this for her mother. And um, it was bought at auction number one, the first auction, and I just rebought it. Here it is. Oh, wow. Can you hold it up close to the camera so you can see the engraving? See the printing? Oh, to mother. Oh, and wow. it's beautiful inside. She loved her mother very much. And I love, you know, this jewelry box. Someone bought it at auction and then resold it. And I bought it just recently. And I just adore it. My husband actually bought it for me because he knows that I love I love that so much. Um, I have a lot of uh, magazines. Here's Shirley with her daughter when she was married to John Agar. I'm sure that was a huge publicity blitz. Hollywood's little princess gets married and then has a child and- Everything, everything. Oh, that was, I have so many magazines with that. And this one I wanted to show you, this is 1930, 1935, I believe that's when the little Colonel came out. So here's the little Colonel magazine. I'll hold it back, back a little bit so we can only see part of it. Okay, very cool. And I wanted to tell you about that all the mothers were interested in what Shirley was doing because I read all these magazines and they are saying, oh, Shirley's doing this and her mother's doing this. Well, right after the little Colonel came out, they had a, um, they had a contest and you would say which dress you like the best and they were giving away 50 dresses because the, the amount of clothes and everything that were sold, socks and dresses that looked like, you know, something she might wear in, in a um, publicity still or maybe from her movie. If all the mothers wanted their, their kids to be wearing their daughters to be wearing these beautiful dresses. So there was everything. And there's collector books just on these kind of things. There was glassware, there was watches, and the collectors today are almost willing to pay anything to get these treasure items from the 1930s. So I'm gonna bring out one of my dolls that was the Little Colonel, because it goes with the magazine. And um, I'll show you what it looks like and it's a size 13. Shirley's dolls came from size 11 inch all the way to 27 inches. And oh, wow. I have most of them, but I don't have a 27 inch one. Then later on in the 1950s, um, there were um, vinyl dolls. So I'm gonna show you a, a vinyl doll and I'm gonna show you what we call a composition doll that um, was made in the 1930s. So first the composition doll. Let's see the face. Can you can you hold the face up closer to the camera? Okay, that's a good lightness on the face. And the dress is the little colonel. Just like the um just like um Shirley in the magazine. Okay. Now, when her playhouse came out, they brought out, they brought out the vinyl doll. And I actually love this one, the polka dot one. And it's vinyl. And these dolls, the ones from the 1950s do not, um, are not as expensive as the ones from the 1930s, but condition and original clothes is the most important factor here. And this one's all original in the polka dot. And that and this one's 1957. Oh wow. So it's amazing that this this doll phenomenon went far past her film career, basically. Oh yeah. There were 1980s dolls um, of Shirley, and I think you could still get some. Wow. For sure, eBay's got everything. So if anyone's interested, they're on there. But you have to know what you're doing. And I suggest um, buying a collector book and reading up on it because. 
There are things that look like the original or they have to have the original tags on them. I'll show you the tag on the little kernel doll. Then you know if, you, if you're educated, um, if it's an original outfit. So I don't know. Oh, can we see that there's a little tag on it? Uh, hold it up closer to the, uh, the camera here. So. Okay, I can kind of see it. Can you, can you stretch out the tag? Because it's kind of curled up in the back. Okay, well, I'll tell you what it says on there. This, the tag, uh, okay, let's see. Okay, this one, okay. I have so many of these dolls and um, the tag is a rayon tag. So that determines if it's a rayon tag or if it's a cloth tag, um, what year it was, you know, it was made. And then the little hat comes off. And as I say, this is a 13, the 11 inch, the 17 inch, and the 27 inch are the rarest. The, the little one, the 11 inch, I would say is one of the rarest. This is 13 inch. There's a lot of these, but this outfit makes it more um, desirable because it's original. And now I wanna show you a picture. For those of you that didn't know what John Agar looks like, see how handsome he is? Oh yeah, he's a good looking man. And then of course the publicity, this was Shirley's 21st birthday album. Can you, can you hold it back a little bit? Cause it's cutting oh, it off. There we go. Okay, and then hold it up a little bit too. Okay. Do you notice her hair is different now? Yeah, it is definitely. Your hair is different. John Agar was very good friends with John Wayne. Very good friends. Oh, look at there. There's the picture. Oh, here we go. There's the picture of her in the costume somewhere holding my um, handbag. That handbag went to the Academy Awards when Jane Wyman won the Academy Award for um, Johnny Belinda, I have that picture somewhere for holding that handbag. There she is. Doesn't she look young there? She yeah. was wearing the costume from Kathleen. That's the costume from Kathleen. And yeah. was in the Academy. And there are pictures here, um, Mr. Belvedere, Adventure in Baltimore, some of the movies she did when she was older. Adrian, how about we look on Facebook and see what people are saying, if people have any comments or questions. Oh, sure. Okay, let's, right. let's hear it. All right, let's dig in here. While, you, while you're getting that, I want to share this picture. This is my granddaughter, and I'm trying to educate her and her sister about oh. Shirley Temple, and she's wearing a 1957 Shirley Temple Cinderella dress. Cinderella was the company that made the look-alike Shirley Temple dresses that Shirley was advertising. They didn't um, match anything she wore in the movies. It was just a very good quality dress. And these dresses go upwards of $100. Well, as a vintage clothes horse, I thoroughly approve of getting young children hooked on vintage style. I yeah, I'm trying to, I mean, I said to, uh, I said to my granddaughter, will you put this on for me? And then I had to explain it to her. <laughs> okay, let's see. Danny Miller says, did you ever think your aunt met Shirley Temple? Oh, did I ever think that who met Shirley Temple? Your aunt met Shirley Temple. Oh yeah, no, my aunt was working in the house with them. I oh, think great. yeah, that's right. I mean, I, you just never know sometimes if they weren't kind of coming or going like ships in the night. So. Oh yeah, oh, I think so. But it was right during that time period. We're trying to document the exact year or two that they work there. And it's, we're having a hard time. We're, we're going through everything to find out because we located a distant relative of my uncle and aunt. Okay, so 
so we're that's trying to different. we're trying to figure this out. I mean, not such a distant relative. I mean, we're pretty close. It was my uncle and aunt, but I still didn't didn't know. But thank you for the question. Yes, uh, Danny Miller is also saying I found a photo of them together from April 1938. It's a composite. We'll send it to you. I think that's he's referring to Annie Wong. Um, by the way, uh, Aunt Danny's also saying I got a Shirley Temple box at the amazing estate sale last week. There are some great things in it, like Shirley Temple socks still in the original box. Wow. Would he like to contact me? I mean, are they children's size socks? Danny, we need to hook you up with Adrian. So yeah, after the show, him. could you give him my email? I sure will. Adrian, I, you and Danny are going to chat after the show. So that will okay, happen. Great. Also, I got a really cool antidote yesterday I would like to share. Um, a small group of us Turner Classic Movies fans had a little picnic at the Joel McRae Ranch in Thousand Oaks, California yesterday. And Wyatt McRae was there. I'm trying to, I'm getting him to do a Hollywood Kitchen in the future, so stay tuned. But in any case, I was chatting and I told him about Hollywood Kitchen and I said, by the way, I'm doing a Shirley Temple episode tomorrow. And he smiled and he goes, well, I have a story about my grandfather in Shirley Temple. I was like, do tell. And he said, well, they were working on a movie. I think it's Our Little Girl, My Little Girl. Anyway, Our Little Girl. Shirley was fascinated with Joel McRae and she kind of had a crush on him. And they were deep in conversation on the set when the assistant director came over and said, Miss Temple, we need you for the shot. And she said, can't you see that I am having a conversation with Mr. McRae right now? So she <laughs> kind of just uh, immediately Put the, put the guy in his place and let him know that that was not okay to interrupt that conversation. And also that Shirley and Joel were sitting, I think it was in a car, they were on their way to something. And she kept staring at his face and touching it, which I think we would all like to do in fairness. And she kept saying, your face is different from my face. And that other person's face is different from your face. And he, he remembered telling um, people, what a philosophical child that's like noticing the details on people's faces. So that was really fun to kind of hear those antidotes yesterday from um, Joel's grandson, Wyatt McCray. I think that Shirley had a genius IQ. I, I oh, she had absolutely it. do. And with the tap dancing, it was very interesting because she was only showed that a few times and she had it in her head and she was able to learn those routines without having lessons. She only had um, a, a teacher for the ballet, but not for the tap. Oh, what Leslie Apple is saying, my mom was a Medlin Kitty just like Shirley. Her mom curled her hair in hopes she would become the next Shirley Temple. Oh, I completely, I completely relate to that. And um, Meglin Kitty, I, I've met some Meglin Kitties, um, people along the way. A lot of them are in their 80s now. And um, the studio stayed open um, for a while after um, Shirley. Now that's how they chose one of her um, stand-ins was the one of her, um, I think it was babe, um, Stand Up and Cheer. I'm, I'm trying to think what it is. It was the one with the um, tap studio. And I have a miniature of that outfit. I wish that I would have gotten that out. It was incredible. But anyways, that's how they picked her stand and was from that tap, from that um, dance studio, because that was, they had all the girls in there from the studio and they were wearing those little um, romper outfits. And I have um, that a miniature of the romper outfit that was made for a doll. And there's only two known in existence. And I love that one. Found it at a thrift store found it on a doll at a thrift store. So that was quite a um, thing to find. But Meglin Kitties, wow. My mother was trying to take me down there or I think that I might've had some lessons down there. Uh, Danny Miller's also saying he's researching Virgin Virginia Wilder and other child stars of the 1930s. Every studio was proclaiming every kid under contract was the next Shirley Temple, not really fair for anyone. I agree Absolutely with Danny. True. I mean, you can't compare people to each other. I think that's always a really detrimental thing to do. Well, we had an actress that passed away recently, um, Jane Withers, and uh -huh. I got to meet her on two occasions. And she played the brat 
in um, Shirley Temple, one of the Shirley Temple movies. And, and a lot of people hated her because she was mean to Shirley. And she was quite a wonderful, talented actress, not only as a child, but as an adult. And I, I am happy to say that I have a few pieces of her memorabilia. Um, by the way, Jane collected a lot of costumes, tons of costumes, just like um, Debbie Reynolds. Um, and they sold that, her daughter sold them at an estate sale. And I was happy to pick up a few of um, Jane Withers costumes. I don't know if you went to that sale, you would have loved it. Oh, I didn't, I wish. Uh, Lisa Dare is saying, wonder if Shirley liked Lori Rogers cocktails. They are made with Coca-Cola. Oh, well, that's a good question, but we have to see when did the Roy Roger um, drink come out? You know, I don't know. We will have to look into this. Roy we Rogers have to look into that and know. see if it corresponded with the same time the Shirley Temple drink came out. Then we'll know. But kids still, I was at a restaurant and they're still ordering Shirley Temples. I always smile at that. You know, I think it's part of it is when you're like a kid, you want to be older and sophisticated like an adult. I know I wanted to be. So like if you see an adult around you with a fancy drink, you kind of want your own fancy drink. So I think that's one of the reasons that the Shirley Temple is still so popular because it kind of gave kids a, their own kind of adult. Absolutely. Sort of and, I, and I could really picture that drink um, being sold in the Brown Derby. I, I can see that in Chasen's too. I can see that that would be one of the places that it started at either or, but they both had it after, you know, they both say that that's where it started, but we don't know. Okay, well, based on the comments, we are getting a lot of love for the Bachelor and the Bobby Soxer, which is oh, as, it good. Be, as it should be. Let's see. Uh, Catherine Bird is saying, I remember her TV show as a small child. I'm not sure which episode it was, but one of them scared me and gave me nightmares. It scared her? Yeah, it gave her nightmares. It could have been something, maybe Little Red Riding Hood with the wolf, maybe, possibly. Possibly, possibly. You can see them on YouTube, I think. I believe you can find. Danny is saying, I remember seeing Shirley's wedding gown at the Santa Monica Museum and so many of her costumes, which are still in great shape. Well, I want to thank that person for bringing that up because before they went to auction, they went to the Santa Monica Museum and they were on display. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And that's where I saw, you know, things that I wanted, but a lot of them went very high. But um, the Santa Monica History Museum has been fabulous um, to, to continue the legacy of Shirley living, being that she lived in um, Santa Monica. And... It's, it owns the stand up and cheer outfit of her with the red and white polka dot. Uh, Barbara Boy Das is saying that I love that you go to retirement homes with your collection. They must love that. Tell her thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And I, and I want to encourage other people to bring their collections out. Just don't keep them in the closet. Bring them out and share them. And you would believe the memories you get back and the people you meet. Um, I'd like, if you don't mind, if I could show the, uh, the picture of Shirley with Eddie Canner. Can I show oh, that? Oh, yeah, please, please. Okay. I would love that. Yeah, because that. Okay, Shirley did a radio show for, um, with, I'm sorry, Eddie Cantor, and here it is. Very cool. And I think the cake was to raise money for polio because it was the birthday of President Roosevelt. I don't know if it's very hard to see. I have the original stored away somewhere and it is, it shows, um, it shows someone, do you see that on mm -hmm. crutches? Yeah, yeah. And they were raising money for um, polio. And to me, this is really important because here she's doing, you know, charity work and there is Eddie Canner. But it's also important to me because there's a connection. When I was nine years old, I was in Playhouse 90 with Eddie Cantor. 
So there I was. That's me. Your worlds collide. Our worlds, yeah, our worlds collide. But these pictures mean a lot to me because they're both with Eddie Canner and um, Shirley did community work. There is another example of her doing community work on the radio to raise money for polio. And um, I've got to say, there's some similarities between when polio was a pan pandemic and what's going on now with COVID. There's similarities in how people felt, how scared they were to go to take their kids to the swimming pool. So. Um, I've known two people in my own lifetime that have had polio. So it really kind of brings it a lot more home when someone you know has it and you see them struggle with it. It's really, that's just a devastating disease. Yeah, that's how I got into community service. My mother was in an iron lung in a polio ward for six months. And um, after she got out, it's a long story and I did part of the story for the Wallace Annenberg. Um, when she got out, she directed me as, I, I was very young, I was um, 13 years old, my brother and I to go do community work. And that started my feeling of working with seniors. So even though my mother wanted to be an actress, she also had this other side of her to help people. And I was able to, in my life, be fortunate enough to do both. That's wonderful. Um, Kathy Bird is asking, where is Shirley's Academy Award? Where is Shirley's? Academy Award. Oh, we're, we're hoping, and I think it's gonna be the, in, in the Academy when it opens. The little tiny one, it's gonna be there. So I'm, ex I'm excited to see it. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it, they're really gonna surprise us with that whole um, display of Shirley's um, clothes. And we did get a little glimpse at one of, at one of her dresses in one of the previews that um, was sent out to um, members of the um, Academy membership. You know, we joined as members ahead of time, charter members. So I know it's gonna be terrific. I hope yes. everyone gets a chance to go and, and everybody knows where it's gonna be. It's gonna be yeah. in the old May Company, right? It's a crossover with Hollywood Kitchen because we recently had Anna Mae Wong's niece, Anna Mae Wong. And they are going to do an anime Wong retrospective at the Academy. Yes. In November. And now we've got the Shirley Temple episode. They're doing Shirley Temple. I didn't necessarily plan it that way, but it, I do want to encourage people to visit there because Los Angeles has never had a really huge film museum, which is kind of ridiculous because we've needed one forever. So I, I think this is going to be a really exciting thing for the city. Uh, Krista Lawler says, can she restate the name of the reproduction dress of Shirley's? She wants to get one for her daughter. Okay. And you can find them on eBay. And um, okay, so Cinderella. Look up on eBay Cinderella. And they have them from the 1930s. The 1930s are very hard and very expensive to find, but this one is from 1950, the 1950s, 1955 to 1957, I believe. And you could find them on eBay. And I, the one that I got, this green one, was never used. It was in it yes, was stop. in perfect condition. Yes. So you could find them. You have to look. The Shirley Temple collectors go on eBay like almost every day. Understandable. Uh, Barbara Boydas is asking, can we all meet at Adrian's house when painting in her memorabilia room is complete? I second that notion. Okay, <laughs> let's make it a date. We should. Oh my gosh, that would be so much fun. Originally, I kind of intended this show to be shot on location with me visiting people's houses and their collections in person, but obviously the pandemic threw a slight monkey wrench into my plans, but I'm not going to let it slow me down. Yeah, the next time I want to show everybody that baby take a bow um, outfit. That's the we don't know how it ever came to be on a doll and at the UCLA thrift store. A friend of mine bought the doll, and I kept on looking at that outfit. And I said it looks familiar, and there's only two known that they did. They made them as samples, and they never made them for the um, dolls. See, most of the costumes in the 1930s, the outfits were from the movies. And this one never got, for some reason, and it's made exactly to detail. 
that's right. And there's there's reproduction dolls too. If you guys would like one second, I will pull out a doll that is from the 1930s that came from England. It's very, very rare, Shirley Temple doll. Would you like to see that? I think I speak for everybody watching when I say yes. So go get the doll. Okay, it'll be just a minute. And by the way, I do want to say after I put the brownies in the oven when we get off the, the Zoom call here, I'm going to have a lot of these left over. So for those of you who live in Los Angeles and can get to the Glendale Atwater Village area, I would love to give you some pecan pie brownies. So please. You're so them. sweet. <laughs> I cannot eat these all myself. And by the way, having tasted some of these last night, I will tell you, they are super rich. They are super chocolatey. A little goes a long way. So if you do eat some, I would definitely recommend a much smaller slice than I have here on the plate and a huge glass of milk to go with them. Okay, let's see if I have any more questions while we're rolling here. Um, if anyone can look this up, by the way, too, um, I think there might have been a Shirley Temple pattern line where people can sew their own homemade reproductions of Shirley Temple clothes. So if anybody um, knows anything about that, uh, let us know, because off the top of my head, I can't remember, but I'm pretty sure that exists. Okay, this is my favorite Shirley Temple doll, and it's almost impossible to find. She's an English doll. Very cool. And guess what? She's a pajama doll. You put the pajamas in the back. She's extremely rare. Wow, where'd you find that? Okay, I bought it from another Shirley collector. It's, it has a very deep history of like four people recently owning it. You tell. And I'm the most recent one and I absolutely adore her. And I wanna give a shout out to, um, someone who is very well respected in the Shirley Temple community, besides Melissa Tonneson, our, our guide and expert. I wanna give a shot, shout out to Tanya Berardi, and she wrote the book on the Shirley Temple collect, um, collectibles. So if anyone wants to get a book, go to um, Amazon, and I'm sure one of her books are there, and they, she tells you every single collectible in there, and also Rita Duba, and um, she has a book on collectibles too, but um, Tanya is the expert in the dolls. So here, here she is, she's my favorite and very rare. If anyone finds one like this, they're exceptionally lucky. <laughs> and it really just amazes me how pervasive Hollywood is around the world and how global globally these things are appreciated oh there were there were um dolls made in many different countries canada had one and then um, um germany and also um, mexico and of course there's the renal doll in france and um that was a cloth doll as well so there's many different companies spain there's many different companies that had shirley dolls in the 1930s and some of here, for those countries as well. I would say Mickey Mouse could be the only rival in the 30s to Shirley in terms of right. pop culture significance, marketing, um, all of that. It just seems like the two of them were the top, you know, icons of the day. I don't know if you knew, but um, Shirley Temple gave um, the Academy Award a few years after she received the small one to Walt Disney for... Um, for um, Snow White okay. and the Seven Drawers. She, she, she honored um, Walt Disney with the award and went to the Academy Awards then. And um, I've got to tell you that sometimes um, her son um, goes to the um, museum during the time that is Shirley's birthday when they have openings or parties or whatever like that. So I've had, a, um, I was very fortunate to meet him and I wore my necklace and um, he told me that that was his grandmother's necklace. So it was great grandmother's necklace to Shirley. That's so interesting. So um, I think that's almost it for the questions that are popping up, at least that I see, but I think a lot of people want to go to your house now. 
So okay. <laughs> when the pandemic is over. Give me a year. There's a lot of painting and remodeling to do. And you know what? And probably when we have the um the uh, party over or the open house or whatever during the um, Santa Monica Museum, um, I might have a few of my things on display there every year. And that's in April. So okay. look forward on there because they have the fundraiser and the luncheon and you, you might meet, you'll meet other collectors and see some beautiful things. My posters were on display there um, when they were doing it about the Bluebird, my Bluebird posters were on display. So Adrian, if people want to find out more about these Shirley Temple luncheons and the Santa Monica Museum, what URL would they go to? Well, they should, they should go to um, Facebook, Shirley Temple Collectors by the Sea. And they can okay. join, anyone can join Shirley Temple Collectors by the Sea and be a part of the conversation every day. You'll meet collectors from all over the world and it's, it's wonderful. Then you'll find out about the luncheons and you'll find out about any events that are coming up. Thank you for asking. And um, a shout out to Marty King who does that particular Facebook page, Marty King on Shirley Temple Collectors by the Sea. Marty King um, has that Facebook page and she's a wonderful lady and welcomes people from all over the world to just join the Facebook page. Excellent. Well, Adrian, you have been a wonderful guest and thank you for venturing into your memorabilia room, even though it's under construction right now to pull out these treasures for us. Thank you for taking the time this week to talk to me and to do this episode with me. I think I speak for everyone watching when I say it's been a real delight to meet you and talk to you and thank you so much. Kira, you do wonderful work too and I thank you for inviting me because it really makes me happy to be able to pull out some of my collection and talk to people that might be interested. And hey, you're a wonderful cook. I'm That's learning. I'm learning. So a shout out to you. That's fantastic. Thank you. And privately message me your address because a Tupperware dish filled with these will be on your doorstep very soon. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you so much. All right. And I think we should end with a toast. So I am going to raise my Shirley Temple. You should raise your uh, Coca-Cola, right? Oh, I'm going to, I, I gave in. I'm doing Shirley Temple. Yes. All right. To Shirley. Hey. All right, Adrian, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for watching Hollywood Kitchen. And stay tuned because I'm literally cooking up so many exciting things for everybody in the weeks ahead. <laughs>